G'day guys, Jared Powell here, back with another edition of On the Shoulders of Giants. And today we're going to be talking about the infamous Nordic hamstring exercise. And to help me with that, I've got two special guests who are world-renowned clinicians and researchers, Franco Impelazari from the University of Technology in Sydney and Christian Torborg from the University of Copenhagen over in Denmark. This is a wonderful chat over an hour where we talk about uh, both Christian and Franco's clinical experience and also the research that they've produced on the Nordic hamstring exercise. There is some disagreement, there is some agreement, and there is some practical take-home messages at the end as well. I really hope you enjoy today's episode with Christian and Franco, and I'll see you next time, guys. Cheers. Hello and welcome, one and all. I'm joined today by two esteemed guests, professors. We've got two of them here, Franco Impalazari and Christian Torborg. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good. Okay, Hello. so before we get to the core of the discussion today, I'm going to introduce both of you, all right? And there's some very long resumes I've got to get through here because you are impressive people. So just give me a minute. So Franco first. Franco is a professor in sport and exercise science and medicine at the University of Technology, Sydney, where he teaches research methods and exercise physiology. Interestingly, Franco started his career as a coach before moving into research later in his career. And I think this is a really interesting part of your story, Franco. Uh, Franco has worked in clinical and research settings worldwide, including Italy, Switzerland, and Australia. Franco has hundreds of publications to his name and his main research interests are training, testing, training load, and research methods. Franco has also been a strength and conditioning coach of several elite athletes who have actually gone on to win gold at the Olympic Games. So that's quite the impressive CV, Franco. Oh, thank uh, you. Not, not, to be, not to be outdone though, Christian. Christian's got an equally impressive CV and also reputation. So Christian is a professor at Copenhagen University, Denmark, with a special focus on orthopedic and sports physical therapy. Christian's also a professor at Lund University in Sweden. So one professorship's not enough for you, Christian. Gotta go for two, that's good. <laughs> Uh, Christian has more than 22 years of clinical experience within sports and orthopedic injury prevention and still works in clinical practice and consults for elite sports clubs and federations on a weekly basis. Christian has provided keynote lectures literally all over the world. I tried to count Christian, but I couldn't count how many countries you've spoken at. Very impressive again. And Christian's research, and this is really cool, has, be, has been mentioned in the New York Times a couple of times, which is, which is no mean feat. Christian has published more than 200 papers and publishes, publishes more than 25 papers annually. Christian has expertise in groin injuries in which he's ranked number one on expertscape.com and also hamstring injuries in which he is ranked 12. So you've got some work to do, Christian, in terms of your hamstring injury rating. We'll look, we'll look for that to change. So I'm briefly just going to give some context about the point of today. So goes without saying, based on what, what I've just told you guys, that Franco and Christian are highly qualified to talk about today's topic, and that is the Nordic hamstring exercise and its role in preventing hamstring injury. So before I hand over to Franco and Christian, I just want to provide some context about today. So if you don't know what a Nordic exercise is, Google it right now. It's very easy. It's simply an eccentric hamstring exercise, and that's probably all that needs to be said about the Nordic exercise. So today's conversation came about because uh, there has been some banter between Christian and Franco on Twitter of all places about what the research actually, actually tells us about the role of the Nordic hamstring exercise in preventing hamstring injuries. And the headline of the Nordic hamstring exercise is often Nordic hamstring exercises reduce hamstring injuries by 50%. And we're going to get to Franco in a minute to address this question. But before we get into the questions, I'm going to hand over to, to Christian because he wants to declare some conflicts of interest. Oh, thanks for that, Jared. Uh, and uh, thanks for, for setting this up. Really great opportunity to discuss this topic. Yeah. So basically, 
we're going to discuss a paper which has been published in DGSM, where I'm also the deputy editor. I've not been involved with the handling of this paper, but still, I, it's, it's important for me to say that this is a journal that I'm affiliated with. And then I've also published a lot of the studies or some of the studies that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm the editor of a book uh, related to hamstring injury prevention as well. And yeah, that, that's probably the main thing. So I, I am not affiliated with making money on Nordic hamstring exercises, but, uh, but I do, of course, have some intellectual bias related to, to this exercise. I just want that to be recognized before we start. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christian. Uh, Franco, did you want to say anything before we get into the chat? No, maybe that just, uh, I also have a conflict, mainly with British journals for medicine, that's all. But <laughs> okay, no, I'm can, joking, because, you know, I, <laughs> there's a, 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 an old story about uh, our re request of retraction for the acute chronic ratio. So my conflict was that one. Actually. Fair enough. Ju Julie noted. Okay, so Franco, question number one, I'm going to hand over to you first. Is this 50% uh, reduction in injury rate of hamstrings with the Nordic hamstring exercise definitive? Is it certain? You've recently published a paper in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology challenging this. Can you please summarize how this paper came to be? And also, what were the key findings of this review? Yeah, I provide a bit of background because uh, um, initially we wrote uh, a discussion letter to the British Journals for Medicine, 800 words, just to underline a couple of, uh, of methodological issues and proposing the new forest plot, just to show how the uncertainties was higher than the one reported. For various reasons, the, the, the letter, the discussion was rejected and therefore we decided to, um, uh, instead just focusing on, on a couple of uh, issues, we reanalyzed methodologically uh, the, the, the topic and the review, and we decide to submit uh, to a journal, which is a bit outside sport medicine. And that's the reason why we submitted there because it's, uh, uh, it's a methodological. So we want you also to be sure to have a, an unbiased radio. And by unbiased, I don't mean um, easy reviewers. We want you to be sure that our concerns were strong enough and the uh, journal of clinical epidemiology is a journal specialized in methodology. And they are absolutely uh, outside our area. So I'm quite confident that the, the review was quite uh, open uh, without any bias behind it, just evaluate the methodological quality. And we did that because we found some errors in, the, in, the, in that meta-analysis. And uh, so we reanalyzed the data and we select the papers based on their research question, actually, but selecting using appropriate methods. So for example, we couldn't uh, include a, a combined altogether observation and randomized trials because this is a bad practice unless very specific situations. So selecting the papers, just the randomized trials and recalculating the summary estimates the, uh, and, and also calculating the prediction interval, which is very important especially in practical application, we found out that the uncertainty is, uh, is, was much higher. And, and therefore, um, in general, you cannot say that is 50% for a simple reason. 50% is the point estimate. So if you focus on the point estimate, you ignore the uncertainty. And, and, and this is quite well known that you shouldn't focus on the point estimates. In addition, this uh, kind of uh, meta-analysis use a random effect model. So the 50% is not the effect of the Nordic hamstring, it's just the, the mean effect of a series of effect that the Nordic hamstring can have in the whole population. And, and, and this is a, a, conceptual, uh, a conceptual methodological uh, issue that is important to remember. So basically our conclusion was that the, the, uh, given this uncertainty, the, the estimates are just uncertain. So we can discuss later, which is because that's the main message. And this is not like someone tweeted that we, we suggested not to use Nordic camps on these kind of things. We also wrote that. We also wrote that while the uncertainty is high, we don't have even evidence to say that uh, they shouldn't be used. So uh, acknowledging uncertainty 
is just a knowledge, a knowledge and uncertainty. It's not uh, saying something against the, the, the Nordic hamstring or it's a question of reducing the expectations. So in summary, this is what we have done. Awesome. Uh, Christian, did you want to add anything or ask any questions of Franco or anything? No, no. I, and, and basically, uh, I agree with Franco and I, I, we also agree with their, with their approach. I think the letter provided by Franco's group is an excellent example of how to actually do a systematic review and meta-analysis in many ways. I, I, I think it would be nice to sort of discuss the research questions that were originally proposed uh, by Van Dijk, uh, by, uh, also by Franco, and then by us, because basically we are sort of asking three different questions. So I think this is important to understand first. So that will probably be my, my first comment. So in the, I agree in the Van Dijk study that they are not looking at the Nordic hamstring exercise or the effect of that, the isolated effect of that. We totally agree on that. And we have acknowledged that uh, previously, and we also acknowledge that in the letter. Um, and I, I, I definitely understand the confusion around the Van Dijk study because it's, it, that's basically, that is what they're trying to investigate according to the research question when you see it in the abstract. When you then go to their, their conclusion, it becomes a little bit more sort of difficult what they're actually looking at because what they're saying there is that, that the programs that include the Nordic hamstring exercise reduce hamstring injury. So that's probably the most correct <laughs> statement of all their statements, but that's basically not what they're setting out to do with their research questions. So, so uh, I think there is a difference uh, if you look at, and again, that's, that's a very broad conclusion as well, because just because the Nordic hamstring exercise is in the, in the intervention there somewhere, doesn't mean that that's the effective part. And that's also what Franco is, is suggesting. So we, we completely agree there. I think when you look at the three questions, I think Van Dijk and, and, and Franco's question is what I would call a meta question. So they're ba basically asking whether Nord the Nordic hamstring exercise uh, is effective. Uh, whereas, and this is, uh, I think, th that's why we are trying to provide some context. What does that mean? Does that mean when you've done one repetition that, that you're protected? Does it mean you have to do 10? Do you have to do it for 10 weeks? And so forth. And that's why we are uh, providing a more specific question because this is, has been our research from 15 years ago when we started. We wanted to understand whether a Nordic hamstring exercise protocol is effective in reducing hamstring injuries. So I think that, that there is a difference there. And then you could say, well, um, why, I mean, so in some ways I agree with Franco and, and why do you just ask a different question? I think, it's, I think it's important to acknowledge that in soccer players, I think the, um, the uncertainty is not as big as suggested uh, from Franco's systematic review would be my sort of counter argument. Franco? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I agree with the, with the, with the questions of Christian, and, and these are normal questions, not only for the Nordic MC, but any kind of intervention. So when you have uh, the summary estimate in the whole population, usually also medicine, what you want to do is to understand if there are subpopulations that can benefit more or less, uh, in that case can be even a, a specific sport or, or something like that. The problem is that uh, we don't have enough data, and I, I, I didn't. Uh, the, I, I, I mean, we reanalyzed uh, the data based on previous meta-analysis. We didn't create a new meta-analysis. So the first point that we should discuss is whether is uh, uh, is worth to investigate or to try to understand, for example, make, doing um, subgroup analysis or these kind of things. If you want to understand more, just using a bunch of, of studies. And, and there are, in several situations, uh, there are people contacted me for running meta-analysis. But if you look in the literature, I have actually very few meta-analysis. Because I think meta-analysis is a, is a strong instrument, is, is very powerful. But if you have few studies, maybe it's not even worth. So, you may ask why you, uh, you, you, you made the meta-analysis with the uh, six uh, studies because it was done in the, in the literature. 
So we said, okay, uh, as long as you want to do this, you want to approach the problem in this way, you have to follow the rules, the rules of science. So we, we didn't suggest to, to try to, uh, to answer to all these questions using six studies. The, the disagreement uh, with, the, with the perspective of, of uh, Christian is more methodological because the, the, the questions are absolutely relevant. So how much I have to do, the dose, uh, what are the subpopulation, this is absolutely... The problem is that we don't have enough data to understand those questions. And our disagreement uh, uh, in the letter was that the, the selecting those two studies means the selected two studies according to two different exclusion criteria that usually you don't combine because or you select the population or you select the protocol. I agree, there are, it's impossible to do with it, those six studies, honestly. So I think that uh, the conclusion of uh, the letter, so the reanalysis of the reanalysis of Christian, uh, um, ignore the, the, the studies that are excluded. Because usually what you do is you have a bunch of studies with uh, some characteristic and other, uh, with another characteristic, you compare the estimates and you say one is higher and lower. The, our disagreement uh, and in our reply is that Christian basically omitted the others. He, he didn't run a subgroup analysis. The other problem is that, and, uh, and I, 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 I hope and, uh, Christian understand why we were a bit strong in a warning about the risk of uh, cherry picking, which is not something you do voluntary. Sometimes I did those in the past the same in voluntary, but I can also do the same. I can restrict a new research question to select specific studies. So I can say, okay, I want to see if only in North Europe uh, uh, using this kind of protocol and, uh, and I can add other criteria so that I, I develop a research question to select a number of studies. And that's why meta-analysis usually you, you, you use everything you have and you run the subgroup group analysis. So I, I think that we disagree to the method, but we agree the, with, the, with, the, with the goal and the necessity to understand those, uh, those questions. Yeah, yeah, good. So I'm just gonna provide some clarity here. So, so because we're playing like this analysis, reanalyses and then reanalyses and letters and all this. So, so the first reanalysis from Franco was proposing some methodological issues with the Van Dyke 2019 review published in BJSM. And then Christian and his co-author, Christian, who was your co-author on that? Le uh, Leslie, sorry, and I think it's important to acknowledge him because yeah. he's actually the first author, yeah. So Perfect, he's yeah. a PhD student here with, with us, yeah. Awesome, yeah, I just wanted to, wanted yeah. to get his thanks, name in there thanks as well. For, uh, yeah, excellent, thanks for that. And, and then, and so you guys uh, sort of proposed to hypothesize taking out two additional studies and then taking out those two additional or taking out two studies not additional taking out two studies and then that actually made the uh, prediction interval um look a little bit better is that is that roughly where we're at here yes and no but because i think i think the most important thing is here is again that i agree with franco that there shouldn't be there should have been done any meta-analysis on this so, yeah. and we didn't, we didn't want to do that either. So it's not, uh, we are in the same boat, you can say as Franco. If I were to look at the evidence today as it is, I would say in 2008, if we look at football players, there was a crazy randomized study suggesting from Norway where they, where they didn't really randomize, but where they looked at two groups, somebody who did Nordics and somebody who did Nordic, uh, didn't do Nordics from two different countries. And they saw that if you did Nordics, you had a preventative effect around uh, 65%. And this, because this is quite a lot of bias in this kind of approach, we did the RCT in, in 2011. Uh, and, uh, and actually, and I was completely biased against the Nordic, but we actually showed exactly the same. So there was a 65% reduction in hamstring injuries once again. And then I would say, so this, these are two large studies and our study had 500 in each group. And then that study was replicated by, by Van der Horst in, in Belgium or in Holland, sorry, Nick. Um, 
And they saw again a very similar um, result, uh, around 60% reduction in, in hamstring injuries. So this is one of the few protocols, and this was the same protocol across the studies that has actually been replicated by different groups in the literature. So, so for me, and that in itself, I think is a pretty strong uh, evidence uh, suggesting that, that this might be effective actually to the level of 60 to 70%. Uh, but then I agree with you, it's still, with, and I, I agree with Frankl that we still don't probably have enough high quality studies to do a meta-analysis on this. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to sort of sound bitter or anything, but if, if we're struggling here with the Nordics now with replication, where we have replication, I think we're struggling with everything in sport medicine. And this is just something we have to be aware of. And this is not a, a, an excuse. Uh, and I completely welcome uh, the robust approach by Frankl. So I would, I would say our sort of uh, approach on, on reanalyzing <laughs> The reanalysis from Franco is was more to say that that uh, wh where we were coming from was actually only looking at uh, teams, full teams, and on soccer players. So sorry, Australia, but we are actually not interested in uh, in AFL or your kind of football uh, with this question, and we've only conducted it in male soccer players as well. So I think that's probably going to be sort of the main counter arguments against Franco, but at the same time, I totally agree. Franco, what do you think of that? I, I think we, uh, at some point, we should discuss a bit about the quality of research that is out there. Because the problem, now I want to, uh, to, to, to approach the problem from a bigger perspective. When, you, when we publish poor studies, let's say, we are adding noise. So even if we have good studies, we just put all the noise around and you may miss uh, important effects. So as a, since we are both researchers, as a scientific community, we, we need, I think we need to make the publication of poor studies much more difficult. And this is the first, in my opinion, the first consideration I would make based on, 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 on the analysis of these studies that I agree, there are other areas in which you have even less studies. The problem of uh, reanalyzing the data, providing a different, uh, a different summary estimate is because I think that if we want to help practitioners, we don't have to create excessive expectations. So I don't want to say that um, the, the no, I mean, I, I'm saying that actually, that that, that meta-analysis created too much expectations because the, the 60, 70% of decrease in injury risk or whatever is huge. So when you implement something in, in medicine that has this kind of effect, usually you realize quite often in practical setting. So I'm not saying that the estimates are wrong. I'm just saying that the estimates may be uh, um, potentially biased for various reasons, which doesn't mean that the study was bad. It means that this is normal in research because that's, that's what, I mean, we need more studies just to, to understand how all the results distribute around. My concern with the, 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 the second research question of, of Christian is that, for example, they exclude one study because uh, there was a subgroup but subgroups are very important in meta-analysis because most of the time we want to know if there is a subgroup that can benefit more. I give you an example, even in the paper of Peterson, uh, the, the paper of, uh, of, of Christian, in the conclusion, they suggest that maybe those at higher risk may benefit even more of the Nordic hamstring. And this is uh, something I agree, it's, po it's possible. So if you look at from this perspective, uh, the study of Engebretsen uh, selected a, a, a high risk group. Of course, how to define high risk is a bit arbitrary, and but this is for for a lot of issues. But they they had a high risk group. So when you analyze in the meta analysis the studies, you can try to see if there is a subgroup, for example, the high risk group that can benefit more or less. For example, in that case. Uh, Engebretsen is one of the few that run a, a per protocol analysis in their study, 
and the prep protocol analysis basically uh, comparing those that adhere to the protocol compared to those that didn't uh, the effect was even less uh, less evident and the uncertainty was higher so this is just to say that subgroup analysis and the inclusion of subgroup is something that we need actually to consider in a meta-analysis eventually we don't combine everything together and we separate and we provide different estimates but the addition of subgroup is uh, is clinically very relevant so that's why we didn't agree actually with the with the exclusion of a subgroup we may agree with the subgroup analysis but you cannot ignore that group because if we analyze the data and we we may say that those that are are at higher risk uh, have no benefit, which is a bit strange. If you think is a bit, um, uh, it, it doesn't sound so good. It may be a it may be a problem of the study. Absolutely, I'm not saying. But even in the study of of Christian, they 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 discuss about these subgroups. That's why I'm saying subgroups are important when uh, you you analyze this kind of information. I, I don't know if Christian agree. Christian. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, this is probably one of the places where we, where we disagree a little bit and it can be very difficult to sort of settle that because some of it is, I, I think that if we look at Franco's study, that's also a sub-analysis and we've done a sub-analysis uh, and we also call it a post-hoc analysis. We call our own a post-hoc analysis and I would say Franco's is a post-hoc analysis. If you look at uh, your study or your reanalysis, frankly, you even though you say you're looking at Nordic hamstring exercise, you also have uh, interventions where you have stretching in in the Engelbertson study. Actually, if the if these players had uh, other uh, previous injuries, they would also have to do other sorts of programs that, than the Nordic hamstring exercise. So even there, you could say there's some kind of contamination. So you you could even argue that you you pull out studies that are not completely a Nordic hamstring isolated interventions as well. So I think we can go back and forth and say, oh, you, you have picked out the wrong ones or you, you shouldn't pick out in this way. Or So I think that's probably not very productive. I'm not saying ours is the, the, is the right way to do it. I'm providing some arguments for a way to look at it as well. Franco? Yeah, I mean, uh, just to clarify, our was not a sub-analysis, the, the reanalysis. Because the problem is that when you want to examine the effectiveness, you cannot use the observational, especially observational studies, which are poor. So the, the, it, you can use the observational where you don't have randomized trials or when you think that the randomized trials have problems or sub or, or a very different groups and so on. So you can do that. You cannot combine. So we didn't run a subgroup of only randomized trials. We, we use the studies that are um, the, the necessary to answer to the research question of the original authors, not our research question. The research question was to examine the effectiveness. And this is what we have done. And in that case, effectiveness is because there are pragmatic studies, not because uh, is, uh, is uh, because sometimes eff effectiveness is used in the context of our observational studies, but in that case, it's just because pragmatic. So we didn't do any subgroup analysis. We just select the studies that are appropriate for answering the research question. And and the 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 issue with um, Engelbretson is, and we we have done this in the in our reply. If you exclude M Engelbretson you still have a very wide uh, prediction interval. The only way to reduce is when you also exclude uh, the, the, the other study that had a different protocol. But the problem is when you exclude because it had a, a different protocol, you in theory need to have a, a physiological reason and a strong reason to do that. So why starting very fast can influence the effectiveness of the intervention for the whole season. So in any case, these are two different criteria. So I may agree that the, the study of Engelbretson can be a bit mixed. And so, okay, you say we may exclude, but I don't see why we have to add up the exclusion of the other, because if we always uh, add new criteria, of course, uh, 
I mean, it's it, it's not very useful. So just to clarify, we didn't run a sub-analysis. Our was not a sub-analysis. Our was the analysis that you should do if you want to answer to that question. And the observational, especially the one in the in the in the in the meta-analysis should be excluded. And even if you want to include, because we, we have a, the table with a, with a few observational in reality that use only the Nordic hamstring. If you have a look to our table too, you see that there are other kinds of problems. There is one study in which there were 112 injuries and in the metanase there were only 10 injuries. So 102 were, were missed. I don't think, I, I'm sure it was not on purpose. There was just a, a, an honest error, but it was an error. So we didn't, we didn't uh, want it to, to go on uh, in the direction of the observational, but the data are there. You can combine the observational if you want just to use the observational, you will see that the estimates are even worse. So just to clarify, it's not a sub-analysis. It's, it's the analysis that they, 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 you should do if you want to answer to that question. Christian, just before I go to go to yeah, you, yeah, I, uh, I would. Can I comment on that? Yes, yes, go for it. Yeah, so again, I would say because uh, if we go back to then the quality of the studies, I would completely agree with the Franco and especially those small studies that are added to the uh, meta analysis. Uh, I, I would totally agree that they, these are actually the studies that add a lot of noise. That would be my counter argument, and uh, they, the quality of those studies are not very good as well. And uh, and again. I would also just highlight that the reason why we took out the, the Australian study was, was, was mainly because it wasn't on soccer. And then we can, it's, we can go back to the interventions probably later because that's, I think that's very interesting as well, is whether a Nordic hamstring exercise can uh, be defined as just that or whether there's very different approaches to actually doing that. I, that would be my argument. Franco? No, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, we... It seems to me that the main problem we have is that there are not enough studies, so we have plenty of research questions, and we don't, we cannot give an answer. The only thing I'm saying is that it's uh, I, I think it's more honest to present. If you want to run a meta analysis, you have to present the results how they are, without trying to 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 propose in a way that are more positive than than they are they really are so it's a question of transparency and in my opinion this is the way i always when i work with the teams or coaches i always try to provide the information <clears throat> not necessarily we have to decide what the others have to do i think to say i think it's better to say okay this is the uncertainty it's up to you to decide if this risk is acceptable or not because one important point of the grade is that, and I think we most of the time we for, we forget, is that one of the the the, the way or one of the criteria to provide recommendation are the values and preferences of the stakeholders, because not all the risks are 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 the same, and uh, uh, when I have to implement something in my team, I have to understand if the impact of a, the potential impact of uh, increasing the risk when implement something is acceptable or not. I can decide to implement something which is very risky because uh, in any case, I'm in a bad situation and it can be, even if it's a bit worse, it doesn't matter. But there are other situations in which the same intervention are too risky. So I think that really being honest with people and say, this is the uncertainty that we have. Uh, because the, the, the kind of approach that uh, Christian made uh, that in, in our opinion was technically not correct, can be made qualitatively. So one can have a look and say, okay, these are the studies on soccer. There are these two big studies. They show some positive effects. I trust them and I do it. But it's different than going to the, I tell you because that, that's, that was my experience in uh, working with some soccer teams. The, it's different than a clinician try to, to convince the managers, the coach to implement Nordic camps and say, oh, we can reduce 50%, 60% or whatever after this, this doesn't happen and they are, they, they are fired. So it's different if they say, if we implement this, there is a, a good chance that we have something, there is a small risk that maybe nothing happened and a very small risk that something bad happened and they, they can make a decision. So in my opinion, in this way, we, we help 
practitioners, which are not strong like us also to sometimes support scientifically the recommendations. They just read something in a British Journal of Sport Medicine. They say, wow, 50%. They go to the team and they say, we need to do that. And it, the managers don't give a shit about British Journal of Sport Medicine or Science and Medicine or whatever journal. They, they say, okay, let's do it. Normally there are players complaining. So that's not always easy to implement. And maybe something, something the, the, the next season, you don't see anything, or you don't see a drop in the, in the injury risk, whatever kind of injury. And I think this is a bit dangerous. And I don't think this is what we should do. We should be honest, say this is the uncertainty. It's up to you and you take the, your responsibility if to implement or not. Because Nordic Amsing are easy to implement in research not that easy to implement in practice. And Christian, I mean, it's difficult to implement, not because it's difficult the exercise, because the environment, the culture is resistant. If I have to be honest, when I speak with people, I say, use some Nordic camp thing, because if someone complain, you can say, oh, I, I, I try to do my best. There are studies showing that is effective. Uh, and so you can protect your back. But it's, I mean, we have to be, because sometimes, People think that when we, we enter in so, uh, so, so in depth in the, in the methodology, we are academic and we are dissociated from the practical setting. I think it's the, the opposite. The reason personally why I care about the methodology is because I want to provide to practitioners information or reliable information. Christian. Yeah, again, I, I think that, I think one of the, the main thing that you could take out of our uh, uh, sort of re-analysis re is also that uh, the heterogeneity was so low well, compared to, to the other um, studies. And, and that seems to suggest that there are studies that might be more relevant to compare than others. And I, I think that's what I would uh, promote to the strength and conditioning coach who came to me and said I would I would rather be based on large, uh, high quality studies than based on a summary statistics, including everything where the, the mean is 50%. And I would agree with, with Franco in relation to, to the study he, he's criticizing there. I would also agree that Franco did a much better job than the original study and a, a more correct job in trying to do a meta-analysis of these papers. But I, still, we're just providing, trying to understand whether this actually works in soccer. I, I, again, you, there are some studies in there that shouldn't be there in our opinion, uh, if you want really to understand how it works in soccer. I think that's our main argument. Um, and, and again, also just highlighting that probably the meta-analysis, neither of them should have been done in the first place. Yeah, but there, there were three before, and now there is a fourth meta-analysis. That's why we reanalyze, because yeah. as I said, if you want to to play with uh, with science, you have to respect the yeah. rules. But I agree with that. But that was not our suggestion to do that meta analysis. Yeah, yeah no, I, I understand the point. It's also true that examining this, uh, even analyzing and running this kind of studies is very complicated because something that we don't consider, also in observational studies is that we have a lot of competing events. So if you focus on hamstring injuries and you analyze the two groups only based on the hamstring injuries, you, you, you never know if there is an effect of the other kind of injuries. And this is very difficult to control. So the, the, I, I appreciate, I know it's absolutely difficult to run these kind of studies. The, the, if I can suggest something is that maybe we can try to, instead of combining all the summary estimates, maybe we can follow what in medicine they are doing in the last years uh, with the individual patient data meta-analysis. So trying to combine the individual data so we can maybe try to control for all these potential confounders that we cannot do when we just have the, 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 um, uh, the, the summary estimates or the summary of, of the studies because basically the unit of analysis is one study. So if you have six, you have six points. But if you can combine all the data, this is much uh, much more powerful. So I think that the future, because I think we have to provide something 
some suggestion for the future. I think the future is associated to more transparency and data sharing. I can tell you that I, for another topic, training load, I try to, to have a previous data set to reanalyze and to show, for example, that there were some issues, methodological issues, but uh, I, I, I couldn't find anyone sharing the data, just one, and is the, the only study that we, we use. And I tell you why I think this is important because I, I don't want to, I may ask the money and run another randomized trial to show that analyzing the data, the results may be different or something like that, but it's a waste of money. I mean, we already have some data. Why we have to waste this data? So why we, don't we combine the, the data that we already have and we try to analyze in a better way? That's just a suggestion. Christian? No, I, I don't. I don't disagree on that. I think it's 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 easier said than done. I think uh, if you want to understand all the the other injuries these players have, that that's a much um, uh, more. That's a big task. Uh, it's it's difficult enough to do a large RCT. So I'm not saying it's impossible. I I, I just uh, let's look at Australia. They haven't been near doing an RCT of this size that has been done in Europe. So. Uh, <laughs> Franco is asking for better quality, so I think I mean we are we are very far from from getting there. I think one I think let's increase the numbers in our studies first. Let's not do underpowered studies. There's there's too many of those as well. Uh, but I, I don't disagree with with Franco's suggestion. But if you have to know exactly what happens to all players, uh, different kind of injuries, you need very very um, good surveillance uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right. So just in just in coming to to the end here, I want to want to finish off with some some closing comments. So Christian, I'll start with you. So based on the research, wh where are you at intellectually, philosophically, in terms of the implementation of Nordic hamstring exercise? Let's let's limit it to to male soccer players. Is it something that you recommend that? that most elite or recreational sport teams should do to physiotherapists who, who treat for those teams? Or do you, do you sort of leave it up to them based on the players, the culture, the wants and the needs, et cetera, et cetera. So just, just where are you at? What's your opinion based on the state of play of the evidence? Yeah. If I, <clears throat> this is not going to be a short answer. Because um, I, I would really like to elaborate a little bit on this. Sure. Instead of me trying to tell everyone what they should do, I mean, that, that would not work. So what I would, and, and, and we have data to show that as well, as Franco says, it's not the compliance and adherence to Nordic is not very good. And it's probably even worse in Australia. Uh, maybe it's getting better in, in, in soccer actually, because they, they are using it as part of the performance plus and the FIFA 11 plus. And I know there's some work where they actually use it in soccer. But if, if we go back to the history of how this all started, it was actually sort of, I come from Scandinavia where in the early 2000s, uh, this, uh, interventions sort of developed. And at the same time in Australia, there was also these hamstring lowers developing. So they were developing sort of in two different areas of the world. The one that, that came out of Scandinavia is, is the one we are, we are looking at in our studies. So that was uh, from, came in the beginning from flywheel and then it was used as an Nordic hamstring exercise. And it actually came from the field as well. So these were athletic trainers, track and field, who used this for performance, but also uh, it came from Icelandic football where they saw that they, it seemed to help them. So it was not something in, in, uh, invented by researchers. It came from the field. And then it was actually tested quite rigorously in, in quasi randomized and then randomized studies. The protocols were very much these uh, eight to 10 to 12 week uh, interventions where you start off very, very slowly, two times uh, five and, and uh, so you only do 10 repetitions uh, in the beginning, and then you build up towards doing 30 repetitions in a, se uh, in, a, in a set, and then you build towards doing that three times a week. So you're building volume, but very, very progressively. And you can control delayed onset muscle soreness by doing that. I would argue that that is how you have to do it. Whether you have to go all the way up to 90 uh, a week, that's a different discussion. But you need to be very careful, and you need to progress very carefully. And you need to make sure that you don't get delayed on. 
now here is my main point. This is what happened in Australia. In Australia, at the same time, hamstring glowers were introduced in some studies from Camilla Brockett. The intervention they used here was, and this is also what we're alluding to, was actually probably more to show how there was a shift in the in the curve and the descending limb of the of the curve in relation to the peak ankle. So basically, that you were getting stronger at longer length when you were doing a lot of uh, hamstring lowers. And basically, what they did is what they did six repetitions, twelve and twelve sets of that. So imagine doing seventy two Nordics in your on your first training day. So this is what they did. And this was what was implemented in Australia in the study by Gabber. So this was the first time this was actually introduced to, to the AFL. And then what happened was that they were not very keen to begin with. So 70% went uh, to the first session. And after the first session, they had dumps like crazy up around six on a zero to 10 scale. And what happened on the next session, and they were only supposed to do this five times during a period of, of uh, of every second week, I think. Then on the second session, only 30% of all the players actually turned up. And I and this Nordic hamstring got a very, or hamstring lowers or whatever, got a very, very bad rep. And I don't think the exercise ever recovered from that in Australia. So I think you can apply this intervention, and this is our, also our point, in a very, very poor way. And it will, might be, even be detrimental to your players. I think I, I'm quite positive. Just like you can over sprint your players and make them sore and have injuries uh, the next weeks if you want to. Okay. So I, that's why I don't want to provide a simple answer, but I think that we have data that if you apply this in a sensible way, it looks very, very promising and it has been replicated. So yes, we use it in soccer here in Europe. I think it's been implemented in soccer in Australia and I think it should be in there somewhere. In the FIFA 11 plus, it's only 15 repetitions they have to do, so it's it's much less. Uh, and I'm 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 prepared to die on that hill unless somebody do, does an equally good study, high quality, high number study, to show that it's actually harmful. Then, then, then I'm I'm prepared to to uh, to um, say that's okay. So I think if if that's probably that would be my answer. I, I can't tell you what you should do. I think you need to have the background of and the history of this to try and understand a little bit how you could probably use it as a as a strength and conditioning coach or a physio that's very elegantly articulated thank you christian uh franco what do you think yeah i think that once a team or a coach want to implement an exercise they know usually they know how to implement there's no one that start with a very high load so usually they normally progress, whatever they do, they always follow a progression. So I think that the way I interpret this kind of studies is to extract the principle. So if the principle is that training the hamstring is beneficial, how I reach the goal, uh, uh, the, the target, uh, the target uh, repetitions, I think this can be individualized by any team, any coach. Regarding the buy-in of the team, I don't know, this is depends on the experience. My experience in professional soccer in a couple of countries is that it's not that high, the buy-in. And the, but I, I think the idea that they don't implement may be a bit misleading because maybe they don't implement the Nordic hamstring, but I know I have friends using other kind of exercise, deadlifts, bridges, or uh, flywheels, and so they train the, the hamstrings. So the, 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 the idea that if they don't do Nordic hamstring, this means that they don't train Nordic hamstring is not actually always the case at least. So they train. And one of the main um, uh, discussion I had when maybe I suggest, why don't you add a couple of sets so you're, you're safe, you can protect your bed. Is that I already train the, the Nordic Kemsing. So usually here, there is a, a common question. Do I have to in, include the Nordic Kemsing because it's an eccentric training? This is the reason why you are saying or suggesting to use the Nordic Kemsing. And this is a question that in my opinion, we cannot answer because the reason why the Nordic Kemsing in any case is one of the most implemented in studies because I don't think there are a lot of other exercises implemented so much in terms of injury prevention in, in, in studies, as, as Christian said, actually. 
is because it's easy. You don't you don't need any equipment. So there's no the, if you want to implement the flywheel and you want to run a randomized study on flywheel, it's much more complicated. You need the the, the device. You need uh, that half of the teams have this kind of device. You don't need one, but more. So it's impossible. It's very difficult to implement. In other case, it's easy. It's like implementing, in theory, sprinting. It's something you can do easily. And that's why, in my opinion, it's very investigated. And that's why it is interesting, for example, for amateur teams, because the professional, they have a lot of equipment. So they can train the AMSIN in tons of other ways. Uh, since I started my career in an amateur team, I didn't have anything. <laughs> Even I didn't have a gym. So in that case, exercise like Nordic AMSIN or uh, or, or other kind of reverse exercises are very good. But uh, uh, in terms of whether it's, for example, a century, the asymmetry training that makes the Nordic MC potentially so um, uh, so so um, uh, good, I don't know, actually, because we, what we would need is a study in which we compare eccentric, concentric, and, and control group, and we know that it's much more difficult to do. So I think that I, I agree, yeah, you, you should progress. If we think to the same study in terms of research, I agree a bit less. I mean, first of all, we, we the, the way you have to, the way you can progress, there are different ways you can, and the, and that you can use to progress because you can just hold less the, the, the Nordic and this is a way that normally you, you use to, to progress. So the, when you become stronger, you hold for a longer time. And this is one of the good things also, in my opinion, one of the confounding factor because you train, you change the, the, the length of the fibers uh, at the same time. So it's difficult for you to understand when you test, for example, the strength. So I think there are different ways to progress with the load, not only with, uh, with, the, with the repetitions, but also with the with the holding less. So, so I don't know if I, I don't have a direct experience of what happened 10 years ago for that study or with that kind of implementation, but I, I think that there are different ways to implement an exercise. Christian, any last thoughts there? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> if I could have anything to that as well, I think consistency for me is the, the biggest thing is so I think and when I go to clubs, also professional clubs, I think that's what I see all the time is that, yes, they have all these machines, they have all these exercises, but there's no consistent uh, approach in place. And what, and I think actually when you look at the two large studies, the one from Peterson and the one from Van der Holst, the interesting thing is that when you look outside of the intervention period, so then you actually have very, very few injuries. So it seems to suggest also biologically that there is an adaptation going on and that you're, it takes time to protect these players. So we have six injuries in, in 450 players in the Peterson study, and we have six injuries in 250-ish players in the Van der Hoor study after the 10 to 13 weeks intervention. So it's just to say that I think it's just like, and these are vaccine uh, days uh, and times, I think it's important that this has to, to work first. We need the adaptation. So I think that is one of the main points I usually make. So I, I would probably agree with Frank. I think you can get your adaptation from many different exercises in many different ways. I'm not so sure that you can just uh, shuffle around between different exercises and it doesn't matter uh, what kind of program you install. I think it's very, very important. Um, and I think that's, if I were to guess on something, and this is why I think I still have a role, whenever I come out somewhere, this is the first thing I always ask them, what is your sort of approach and what is your program in place? And I get often surprised at the highest level about how little overall approach they, they actually have. Um, so I think that would be my sort of experience uh, from this. So I think there's room for improvement, not in relation to necessarily uh, just what exercise, but also what is the consistent approach you're, you're trying to, to implement to address this issue. Yeah, I agree with you there. It's all a little bit ad hoc and random in a lot of these, these environments, which is quite surprising uh, from the outside looking in when it all looks very smick and professional and, and well run. So that's a point well made. Uh, Franco, any, any thoughts? No, I mean, the, 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 the implementation is always 
complicated in professional setting. Whatever the the strategy and, and I, I I I have an idea that there are a lot of stuff that work well anyway. So I'm quite I think they are doing their best to prevent injuries. So I'm not very I'm not negative about the implementation. Maybe they don't implement that exercise or other exercise, but they do a lot of things. So I I I I think that. I mean, Nandi Kamsing is interesting, is uh, absolutely, and I'm saying it's not. I just have the feeling that is a bit uh, overestimated. Um, and if we talk about practical experience, I think that if you have something that has a 60, 70% of efficacy, as, as long as one implement and they see a drop, they would always keep that kind of exercise. Normally, when I discuss about these things, people say, yeah, but you know, it's multifactorial. Yes, it's also multifactorial in the study. So if you see in a study, you have to see also in real life. Um, I, I want to add something else uh, regarding the methodology. I said that the observational studies are not uh, in, uh, good enough, uh, the, the one in, in the, in the meta-analysis to answer to a causal question. But observational studies are uh, a good uh, kind of design if properly done. So randomized trial is the gold standard, but there is a lot that can be done with observational studies. But the problem is that they necessitate a very, very accurate uh, methodology. Otherwise it's easy to, 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 to arrive to wrong conclusions. So since I, I, I focus on the randomized trial in the, uh, in the meta-analysis and everything, but I want to say that observation are, are absolutely something that probably we use very bad. I, I mean, a case control has a very, very bad reputation in general, but the case control is very powerful. It's using medicine for run, rare diseases and these kind of things. And they are done up very well, uh, sampling the control in the proper way. So I think that even in terms of injury prevention, we can rely on observational studies to have information that are estimation of causal effects, of course, but is better than nothing, but we need to improve the methodology, not only because the problem is that, is that also uh, there are randomized trial and Christian, I know I, I agree is that are randomized trial, but I would never try that randomized trial. I, I trust more an observation of well done because having the label randomized trial doesn't mean that this is good as is well done. Randomized trials are prone to a lot of confounding anyway. When you lose someone, when you have uh, dropouts, you, have, you are basically losing the randomization. So you are risky to introduce bias and you have to compensate in some ways. So I, I think that <clears throat> to answer to some of the questions that also Christian raised, observational study can be, um, not the best solution, but can be a solution. That's my final consideration. Christian? Yeah, yeah, no, I would add to that. I, I completely agree. And if I could, if we could switch uh, some of all the risk factor studies to observational studies with intervention, I would, I would prefer that. I think we have way too many risk factor studies because they're easy to do and they, they, they just confuse us. So uh, I would definitely go much more towards interventions at RCT level sometimes, but also back to observational studies uh, where you actually also, and also to implement in, uh, implementation studies to try and see how does it actually look in the real world when you then try to implement, do you have a similar effect? So I, I completely agree with Franco and I think we are not doing that uh, well enough uh, and we could, we could really help a lot there, I think. So totally agree, good point. Good to end on agreement, uh, gentlemen. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna finish with a couple of frivolous questions, if you don't mind. So, do you, do either of you do uh, the Nordic hamstring exercise in your own routine? And if so, how low can you go? I, I mean, I can, I can start. I, I, I have my, my rack, so I, I, I use deadlift, squatting. And, and bench press. These are my three, the three bigs that I use. So for, I don't do Nordic, but I have some athletes that use Nordic hamstring. Yeah, cool. Christian? 
and for me it's i don't do it systematically uh, and i don't get i I'm, my running is so slow now that i can't get a hamstring injury anyway so uh, but i i do it uh, especially so that i'm able to show it <laughs> to the athletes so i keep it up a little bit so i'm actually able to show how it, how it should look uh, that's probably the, the minimal dose i get hello can you go christian is that you that i see in all the viral videos on instagram uh no but that's actually i i disagree with how low can you go you have to <laughs> hit the ground so yeah. that's the main point is that you actually you fall down and you resist for as long as you can and you have to activate as far as long as you can it doesn't matter how low you go go or whether you can come up again it's it's uh it's a super maximal uh, exercise and you need to sort of resist the fall all the way so i think that's actually a misconception of the exercise as well also those who show what they can hold and what they can come back up from, I think is, is, a, is the wrong way to do it again. Mm. So whilst it looks impressive, it's, it's no more effective for injury prevention. I think it could actually maybe be counter uh, effect. Ah. That's a really interesting point. Um, Franco, do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, okay. Uh, it makes sense. Cool. Um, uh, it's for any exercise actually. Yeah, very true. And just, just lastly, guys, uh, I always ask this question to all my guests. I didn't tell you about this because this is fun to see what you, what you actually can come up with on the spot. So what, what book are you reading right now? It can be any book or what TV show are you watching? And I'm going to ask both of you this. So, so Christian, I'll put you on the spot first and foremost. Are you reading a book or are you watching a TV show? Oh, I'm, I'm watching uh, <laughs> Downtown Abbey with my wife. <laughs> nice one. Nice one. Good show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's it's a lovely show. Yeah. There's plenty of seasons to get through as well, so it'll keep yeah, you yeah, occupied yeah, for months. Yeah. I, I I do fall asleep as well, so I have to go back uh, from time to time. So it takes quite a long way to go through it all. Yeah. You're you're that guy falling asleep on the couch. It's good. Uh, <laughs> Franco, what about you? I don't know. It's to answer because uh, you think I'm a nerd, uh, but <laughs> the book I'm reading now is statistical rethinking. So, that's, and but if Makes you ask sense. Me, but if you ask me about what I'm watching, I'm absolutely a nerd. So I'm watching now. Okay, Dexter, New Blood, uh, the the um, Okai. I, I have the passion over this kind of. Uh, so the, the the. That's good. Cartoons, Marvel, DC, Titans. I wish that it's not bad. Cool. Yeah. I've just finished watching the uh, Juventus documentary on Amazon Prime, uh, which was a which was a pretty cool pretty cool watch to see all the guys at work. And there's, they were, I didn't see any Nordics taking place, uh, but Ronaldo's got some interesting thoughts. That's my son's uh, favorite club, so uh, yeah, ah. we, I watched that with him as well. Yeah, is what do you think about about the behind the scenes? It's a, with the physios and the sports medicine setup. Is it typical from your experience, Christian? Uh, you don't get a real insight from that, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. But I, but uh, so I wouldn't judge on that. I think, um, no. but I, I, I love to see those kind of of, of, of series as well. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think they're really really cool. Uh, I never watched that because uh, most of the time they're bullshit. <laughs> yeah i know that i'll tell you what documentaries but i know some documentaries on things that i live in first person and they're absolutely rubbish so i really don't don't trust uh, in juventus we have a phd student by the way so uh, we know what they are doing but yeah. i mean the documentaries are are shows though yeah uh, usually i i don't even watch that it's an entertaining Plus, you get to see Cristiano walking around with his shirt off, and he's in pretty good condition for his for his mid thirties. So respect to him. All right, all right, gents, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. So again, thank you so much for your for your thank time you. and also your commitment to you know open science and opening up these conversations for everybody to listen to. I think it's really respectable. So well done. Um, you can thank follow you. Franco you, on Twitter, no problems at at Franco Impel. And Christian, he is at K Torborg, and I'm going to reference all of these below in the show notes. So thanks very much, guys, and I'll, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.